Welcome, welcome everyone. Please make sure your cameras and microphones are muted. Well, before we get started, we will let you turn those back on and answer, ask questions at the very, very end. But for now, just our presenters. I am going, oop. And I am going to spotlight me so you can see me. All right, everyone. Welcome to LumaCon 2022. This is the eighth LumaCon, and obviously we had to switch to online at the last minute, but we were graciously offered the opportunity to have the Rebel Legion present for us today. And um, I'm going to give us a few minutes to let everybody in the room, because there are still some people coming in. Is there more? Let me just hear another one. Okay. Okay, so this is LumaCon 2022, LumaCon Online, the first part of a two-part LumaCon for the first time ever. Yay! Uh, I want to thank you all for joining us here today, and I'm going to hand everything over to the Rebel Legion. We are recording, so keep that in mind. If you want to ask questions later, you can do so with your microphone and your video off if you would like but you do not have to um and take it away guys let me who's starting is it Lindsay? Uh, uh, jen i believe yeah <laughs> okay i'm going to... um hey uh this is shelly i'm the base commanding officer at rebel legion and our base and thank you so much to lumicon we love lumicon and attending lumicon um, and we just wanted to give you a brief overview of what we would talk about if we were in person, but obviously we're not in person. Um, I think we're going to start off with Jen kind of going over the basics of, um, what is the Rebel Legion? So what is the Rebel Legion? The Rebel Legion is an international Star Wars costuming charity organization. We, all of our costumes are the good guys and they're screen accurate. That includes Jedi, X-Wing pilots, Rebel troopers, Wookiees, and then you move into face characters like Rey, Princess Leia, Luke Skywalker, Han Solo, The Mandalorian. Um, we're starting to get more and more costumes as the shows go on. So like the Book of Boba Fett, Boba Fett is part of the Rebel Legion because he is now a good guy or the hero character uh, members of the Rebel Legion give back to their communities by participating in charitable events and such as like Star Wars Reads Day, school fundraisers, going and visiting kids in the hospital, as well as coming to conventions like Lumicon, which is one of our favorite events, uh, and then sporting events. So if you ever go to any of the Bay Area team's Star Wars nights, you can see us as well. And then to be a member, I mean, you have to have at least one screen accurate Star Wars good guy costume. And if you're still looking at like, what do I want to do? What costume do I want? There's a whole list of the standards and the standards will be able to put you in the right direction, point you in the right direction and give you like a list of needs for each costume. You also have to be 18 years of age but if you're under 18, you can join the Galactic Academy with the parent. That is a little less screen accurate, but if you're trying to go and get up to the Rebel Legion, it's a great place to start. So you've built your whole costume. Now what do you do? You take pictures front, back, sides, and then any close-up details that you want that show all the elements of your costume. That can be like your full shirt, can be the detailing on your shirt or on your collar, um, arm wraps, any leather pieces, things like that. Uh, once you have all those to put together, as well as an action shot where you look super cool, you join the Rebel Legion forums. And once you get your form name approved, you go and submit your costume under, um, it's like create or add new costume, I believe. 
and you put everything in and then you wait for communication from the Legion to enlist. You will be contacted by one of the Legion-wide costume judges who will work directly with you to either give you some helpful tips to improve or to say, congratulations, you made it. Um, once you're approved, get involved with your local base. Uh, for Petaluma, that's Endor Base, which is us. So then you just go to the section of the forums that's for Endor Base, go under like base members only, you'll see a bunch of events listed and sign up. And you can come hang out with us in person, maybe, possibly, if we can do in person again. <laughs> uh, Rebel Legion costumes have costume standards. As I said, for example, the Jedi standard lists the required elements of the costume. We will get into that in a little bit. There are also tutorials and discussions in the detachment area of the Rebel Legion forums. So for Jedi, that's Knights of the Jedi Order. And many costumes have build groups on Facebook as well. Plus, you can also contact the local base and so because some of them have prospects on Facebook where you can ask questions and post pictures and feedback. Endor is really great about this. We have a bunch of people that have made a ton of different costumes. So if you're even confused by build groups, confused by the forums, we can probably pair you up with somebody that has done the costume or at least knows enough to be able to help you and guide you in the right way and have like a more personal one-on-one -on -one experience. And that's Endor base. So some of our costumes. You can see a bunch of different ones there. And now, handing it over to Pat, who's going to talk about how to be Jedi. All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Pat, and I kind of wanted to get an idea of how old everybody in this panel is. If that's okay for you to kind of type in an age range in the chat, it'll give us an idea of how best to get you the information you need moving forward. But in the meantime, while you're all typing that up, one of the things you need to know uh, about the Rebel Legion is one of the biggest sections is the Jedi. And if you are super into the Jedi, please also type that into the chat and be like, yes, the Jedi are my favorite characters. Or gosh forbid, you're one of those other kids who are like, no, may all the Jedi die in Order 66. I'm an Imperial. Um, but in the meantime, we are going to talk about the different parts of a Jedi costume. Um, there are a lot of layers. You have the outer tunic, the inner tunic, tabards, the obis, the belt. The tabards are these things right here on top of us. Um, on top of your obi, you have a leather belt. You've got food capsules, which you'd like to think in real life actually has snack in them, but they don't. Um, we might start putting in like pip pixie stick dust in there just to see how it goes, but we'll give it a try. Uh, then you have something called a cover tech clip. It's this funny little plastic doodad that allows you to hang your lightsaber on from your belt. Um, and speaking of belt, your best prop of all time is going to be your lightsaber. Um, if you are a Jedi, it is most likely because you wanted to get a lightsaber in the first place. And then once you start with one lightsaber, you might get kind of addicted and might end up wanting to get more. So in the chat, I just want you to type what your favorite color lightsaber would be if you could get one, or if you already have one, what color is it, All right? And then of course, you can't have a Jedi that just has a top. You have to make sure you either have pants or a skirt. Um, and yes, every gender is allowed to have a skirt on, especially if you're a Jedi librarian. And then of course you want to have boots. All right. And so like we said, the finishing touches for everything, remember when I mentioned that weird little plasticky thing? That's that black cover tech clip right there. Um, and of course, pouches come in super handy. They're great for holding your phone if you have one. Um, IDs and things of the sort. Now, some Jedi, uh, when they make their costumes, I'm going to move mine a my camera down a little bit, have hidden little pouches inside of their obis for ID cards and identification so they don't have to carry so much. Um, Jedi, uh, some Jedi, if you have pants, are lucky enough to have uh, pockets. And like everybody knows, pockets are the best things in the world and should be included 
in more things. Um, for Jedi, every color lightsaber is available except for red. So if your favorite color is a red lightsaber, hi, that's me, um, you can't wear it with your Jedi costume. So you do have to get a color that's similar-ish, like you're allowed to do orange, you can have white, you can have purple, or even aqua or pink. So those are all color options. All right. Um, did we get any great answers about colors? I didn't have the chat open. I'm looking at it right now. I'm seeing lots of blues, purples, greens. And then just so for everybody who did type a color into the chat, each color um, means a different thing. So it's sort of like a different path depending on what you want to be as a Jedi. So there's a lot of lore um, and storytelling behind it. So it's a lot of fun making sort of a character that goes with each costume. And then, hi, I have a lost cat on my lap. Um, and then I'm noticing that a lot of people in the chat are 18 plus, so yay you are more than ready to join us next. Um, so I am going to move on quickly to um, another type of costume. Here obviously is a development of an Ewok. So Ewoks are considered good guy characters since they help the rebellion. Um, we don't have any height requirements for this costume. The only height required costume, I believe, are for Wookiees who have to be above a certain height. So stilts, unfortunately, for most people. Um, so I just wanted to give a quick overview of the process for building this costume. Um, the face is actually made out of a, uh, like a camping mat. Um, half of the plastic Christmas ornament balls that you can fill with things you could buy at a craft store. Uh, the nose and mouth are made out of Sculpey, which uh, is painted. Um, behind the eyes is cheesecloth, which I colored with fabric pens. Um, obviously, tons of faux fur and hot glue were involved in this process. Um, the hands and feet were things that I bought uh, Yoda hands, uh, which I gave him a nice pedicure because um, his nails are pretty gross. Uh, some aliens who don't have fingernails, so I had to make fingernails for those, which you can see there, made out of Sculpey. Um, so there are a lot of modifications, um, and you can also see uh, the fan system, which is set up in the head so the eyes don't fog up, and also so that I don't overheat when I'm wearing this costume. Um, and also the original Ewoks had foam in their body to give them that round shape, but that's pretty uncomfortable to wear for many hours. So you can kind of see the boning structure that is underneath the whole costume. Uh, I have a picture here of sewing this fabulous faux fur, which um, nearly killed my sewing machine. Uh, <laughs> and the end result, um, which looks pretty great in a forest. So there he is, Wicket the Ewok. Um, there's, so on Rebel Legion, there's a whole uh, very popular detachment called the Wretched Hive, which is uh, all of the aliens, um, alien pilots, alien officers, um, pretty much any alien you want is in there, Jawas, um, Rodians, any alien in Star Wars, you can probably be it with varying levels of discomfort, depending on how much latex you are comfortable having on yourself. And speaking of aliens, we're gonna transition to Lindsay. And we go to aliens. Um, so I'm Lindsay, I am Android Base's executive officer. So Shelly's number two. Um, I'm currently wearing my Jedi, but I also have a Harrison doula, and as you'll see on this screen, this is sort of the progression of where I started and where I ended up um, in making my headpiece. So, we starting on the left, we have one that's basically just regular craft foam and fabric, and it's all stuffed, and it was not very comfortable. Uh, Next to that one is then um, moving up to like upholstery foam and a lot more comfortable, still stuff, not as heavy, great. 
And then the next two are um, both cast in silicone, uh, both actually made by a fellow Endor base member called Pam. Um, they're very, very jiggly. And when you see these in person, they're, they have such a great movement to them. And like, if you touch them, they're, they're just fantastic. I love them. Um, this particular costume that I'm wearing at the moment, I actually also have a Twi'lek version of it in yellow. So I get to play with that in these too. And then, um, let's see. Here's the process of patterning for my flight cap and the headset that goes on with the Hera. Um, so fairly standard, simple, make a duct tape pattern, figure it out. Um, I think this part, this is one of my older caps. I believe this one is made out of marine vinyl. My current one is made out of leather, uh, but um, you can see where I have made all sorts of little things. So my earpieces actually connect to the head cap with magnets. Um, they need better magnets. They don't stick on as well as they need to. <laughs> And then down at the bottom is just how all that went. And then my two versions of Hera and a loft cat. <laughs> Always a loft cat. Always a loft cat. I think that Hera with a loft cat is from Lumicon or. Yes, that, uh, that photo is from Lumicon. Yeah. Or no, wait. Yeah, I think that was the uh, no that was that one was um, Lodi World something. of Wonder. Oh. <laughs> but our initial photo with the the turquoise background is definitely Lumicon. Yes. Um, <laughs> so we understand that the Petaluma Library has a three D printer, and we just wanted to kind of give a little overview of how three D printing has really um, changed the game as far as uh, armor and detail pieces. Um, in the past, people would try to fabricate things um, using foam or Sintra, which you need to heat up and it's just a very delicate process. Or if you were dealing with armor, it would be, you would have to find someone who had a mold. You would have to hope that the mold fits you. Um, if it didn't, you would have to do a lot of adjustments. Um, with 3D printing, you can print it and go, oh no, that's too big, and print it again. And it's not a big deal. It's not hugely expensive. It's so adjustable. Um, so this is just, uh, I created a Cardoon costume earlier in the year. So this is just a wall of pictures of the process <laughs> of from printing it, where it has a lot of print lines, you have to sand it. Uh, you have to cover it with a filler primer that can be sanded, and then they're still imperfections, so you bondo it, but then you can get into painting it so that it has the appearance of the screen used armor. Um, so you can see I went from spray paint layers to hand painting um, just to get those details down. Um, so you can do anything from making it look like scratched up metal to you can tell there's a knife um, that's in her, in her boot. Um, you know, you can paint that to look like leather. It's just so versatile. Um, it's really incredible and has really made a huge difference on how affordable and accessible it is um, to create all kinds of small and large costume pieces. Um, I think Amy wanted to talk a little bit also about some little detail pieces for her costume. Yeah, just um, since we're talking about 3D printing, just that last picture on the bottom right is what I'm wearing right here. Um, and just that these little pieces are 3D printed and you might wonder how, how are we attaching these? So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna reveal this right here. I've got magnets. So here's, this is the badge for this and it's got magnets on the back and very strong magnet ooh, bars that will stick to it. And the same for these little pips. They have tiny little magnets on the back side. And, uh, and then my other character that I play a lot, you may see behind me, uh, this is a General Leia costume. And 
the belt buckle itself, I'll talk about more of the belt later, but the belt buckle itself is 3D printed and I have another general layer of Force Awakens, which is also, you can see, it's not painted on the back. And it just really, 3D printing has been a godsend because <laughs> it makes these really difficult, tricky pieces um, easy to use. And yeah, and I just saw a question about weathering pop up. Um, and so as far as like the Cara Dune armor, um, so you can see kind of on there, initially it was gray painted silver. Um, I then used uh, liquid latex to paint the spots that are gonna remain silver and then painted over that with uh, the turquoise spray paint. And then you can rub off the latex. So it gives that chip appearance. It is basically purposefully chipping the paint. Um, I know a lot of people use airbrushes to do weathering. I don't currently own an airbrush um, and I have an art background, so I'm more comfortable hand painting. So I basically took uh, acrylic paints that are watered down a lot and just did a lot of layers and kind of wiping off to give that appearance of something that's been out in the world for a long time. You know, you obviously just have to concentrate on where, is, where are things sunken in so that's going to be darker. Where would something functionally get worn by touching something else? And you have to think about it a little bit. Um, and also it's a lot of people will go to um, the costumes on display um, and take really great high res photos, which then you can zoom into and kind of get a really good view of what the screen used costumes look like. So you can try to replicate that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then the other thing that will happen like this is if it's on fabric, you can just use eyeshadow. That's what I have on here. Um, you do have to reapply it. Again, people will use acrylic paint. Um, the other thing that a lot of people will do to get kind of a more dirty appearance is dyeing with tea, dyeing with coffee. That's more with fabric. So that way you can get that like dirt without having to actually be in dirt feel. Um, people also sandpaper fabrics so they can create uh, false wear. Uh, we do have somebody that has a Jedi that has thought in detail of how his Jedi would be like battle worn and has done that as well. So you can be as detailed as that, or you can just be like, okay, this is what this character has for weathering. This is how I'm gonna do it. Yeah, and I think uh, like uh, for the fake leather that's on the 3D print for the uh, scabbard for the knife, um, I also did some kind of dry brush techniques, which gives more of a pattern. Um, so there's a lot of different techniques you can use to try to get that weathering. I know on fabric, some people use, it's like a spray for flowers, like flower arrangements. Um, I use that on the hood for Wicket. Um, it just gives kind of a stipply dirty look without being really crazy. <laughs> I just want to add, um, for uh, sometimes a Sharpie, it works for things. It's just, um, you know, be, be ex experiment, just think outside the box. Um, and you, you'd be surprised with what you could use that you just have around the house. Yeah. And it's with experimenting also, like make sure you do test sections and test mm -hmm. areas because you don't want to end up like having to redo the entire part of your costume if you're done before, like you've weathered it and you're like, oh, I don't like that. I can't get it out. <laughs> um, there's a lot of testing with that. There's a lot of testing with dyeing, any fabrics, so also be prepared for doing tests. <laughs> yeah. Right, and don't don't suddenly, you know, dump a bunch of paint on something you just spent 12 hours sewing, like yeah. <laughs> be intentional. <laughs> we can, can I add a little bit about dyeing and weathering? Yeah. So for like free resources, um, if ever you need to dye something with coffee and you don't wanna waste coffee, you can go to your local coffee shop and ask them for the grounds and they will gladly hand you a garbage bag full of coffee grounds that you can take home, boil up, and then strain the coffee water, and then you have free dye. And then um, the other thing you can do is if you are going to dye larger bits of your costume, it's highly recommended to use a washing machine system uh, versus a pot system, uh, just because you will get a lot more streaks in a pot than you would with your washing machine. 
Yeah, and if anyone's really interested in dyeing, um, I don't get any kickback for this, but uh, <laughs> Dharma Trading Company um, has a lot of excellent resources on how to dye and what the different dyes are. I'm not telling you you need to buy from them. I'm just saying they have a lot of information. <laughs> I mean, I have some of their dye. It's great. <laughs> so It's wonderful dye. Yeah, I'll use it too. All right. We may have more questions on that, but I'm going to move on. <laughs> we'll move on. So as Shelly mentioned before, sometimes uh, you find a costume that you want to do and you have to find someone who makes the costume. And the person with the molds has molds that are for someone much larger than you. So I'm about five foot four. And this armor that I'm getting fitted here is uh, clone armor from the Clone Wars and is intended for someone who is five foot ten. <laughs> so uh, you can see we had to do a lot of fitting and adjusting and all sorts of silly nonsense to get it. Like I'm quite uh, like trimming things down. And the problem with doing that is that you have to be very, very careful that you don't lose the proportion. <laughs> But, like, in some places you can fake it, but with this one, I will be needing to pad out both my bodysuit and my armor itself, because there's just, I will lose all of the proportions on it <laughs> otherwise. Uh, let's see. So, here's a couple of photos of where some of the adjustments had to be made. So... Got like on the side under the chest piece, I had to trim it down about three inches on both sides. So we had to try to get that to sort of line up again. And then in the hips, I was just able to get it on with them butted right up against each other, but realized that if I gain any weight at all, for any reason, <laughs> this will not fit. So uh, we had to put that little uh, bar there in between them and you wouldn't normally want to have this. The only reason I can get away with it is because it will be hidden by the belt boxes, <laughs> um, which are still working on, but slowly getting there, you can sort of see how it's coming along and how it's fitting there. One of the secrets of costuming is that many of us tend to sit on costumes for an extremely long amount of time. <laughs> yes, um, these fo those photos I think are when did I take those? Uh, two years? I think the, like, October of 2019. <laughs> so, currently, the actual armor is sitting just behind me. <laughs> um, so, we talked about uh, kind of the armored costumes, Jedi, and um, there's many good guy characters to talk about, and many of them have soft costumes. So, uh, Amy was going to talk a little bit about this magnificent costume. Yeah, um, this is General Leia in episode nine, the last uh, film. And uh, some of the parts were relatively easy. There are some soft, almost like pajama pants that are kind of a plum color. You can hardly see them. They were very easy to make. The blouse was uh, a little tricky, but not too bad. Um, guys, the, the cloak that I'm wearing, the waistcoat is was the most, one of the most nightmarish pieces. I got help from somebody who's an excellent seamstress that is also in the Rebel Legion. And I had access to the authentic uh, movie screen used costumes. So I got all the measurements and everything. Um, this took a lot of time and a lot of money. You wouldn't think looking at it, but it, 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 it was really expensive. Um, and then the belt uh, on the bottom, you see two shots. The one on your left is the screen used belt and the one on the right is my um, duplicate. And it's right here behind me. And uh, I just wanted to show you a little bit about how I made it. It took a while to figure it out, but once I got it. So like I showed you before, I got a 3D printed uh, belt buckle. It's slightly different from this one, but I had the same guy make it. I just uh, sent him some new artwork. And then the, these pieces are metal. Um, I wound up getting brass tubing 
which I then used a tube cutter to get little, little tubes. And then I would thread them. And then I used wire to get the hardware store. Wired, uh, thread them. And then I would make links like this. And then I would keep attaching more and more and more and more. And um, one of the tricky, one of the side things about this that you can't really see, but is that the brass only goes to the, to the side. And then I put some leather and a really heavy buckle on the back. And, um, and that's how I made that belt. <laughs> um, so metal crafting, um, it, it, it was fun once I figured it out. Um, and you just never know. You take on a costume. Part of the reason I took on General Leia, uh, I have another General Leia costume, is that they're soft, they're flowing, they look comfortable. But oh my gosh, this was so much more work than I thought. It took me, I think, about 18 months to finish this. And that's with a lot of time off in between just thinking, how, how do I do this? Yeah. Yeah, a lot of costumes have a long history, and so someone else has already figured out how to approach it. But if you're working on a newer costume, um, often you have to get pretty inventive to figure out how the people in the movie made that thing. You know, it, it isn't a thing that exists out there that you can just purchase. Right, right. I should have mentioned that. I was the first one to, to I mean, there were some other women that did come up with uh, costumes, but I think I was the first one to because they used my work in progress for the standards and, that we have now so and if you're ever wondering with the standard so like this costume doesn't have a standard uh when or it didn't have a standard it still technically doesn't when uh, Amy was approved you can join with a costume that doesn't have a standard yet especially if you do as detailed a build thread or you see somebody else with it and you go as detailed in your description that you have to put in as possible. Um, because for instance, this costume, I got it approved um, before The Last Jedi even came out. <laughs> we uh, uh, had like the Vanity Fair photos and people were looking at it and the, the scene from the trailer and people went and made it. Uh, so sometimes you get people like that. Sometimes you get um, people who see like one background character do this whole big build thread and can do it and have zoomed in, zoom in on toys, zoom in on promotional pictures to find that like little seam. So that's kind of how detailed we get. And especially like the belt is a really good example of that. That Amy yeah. had. We, and like the first costume I got approved with, which is... Um, one of Hera's costumes, but it's in one episode for like 10 minutes. It's, this was, uh, I got approved in 2018. That costume still does not have a standard. And I think there's only four of us in the entire Legion, like worldwide that have been approved for it. Um, however, like in the case of that particular costume, standards have been proposed and potential amendments to that standard have been proposed. They just have not done anything with it yet. Yeah, and if you, I think if you want to, uh, you know, you know you want to be approved, you don't just want to have a costume just to wear at a convention. If you want to be part of the Rebel Legion and it's not a standard yet, but you know other people have made it, like, like me in this costume, if it's not a standard yet, but you know I got approved. You can access my work in progress uh, posts in the forum. You can talk to me, you can ask me questions. And if you follow the same way I did things, likely you'd get approved, that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, the, the Cara Dune uh, season one uh, has a proposed standard, which hasn't been approved, but you can still look at that standard. And then um, I have a build thread, several other people have a build thread with very extensive photos. so. I mean, people are more than happy to tell you how they did things and help you along. I mean, we're all, we all love these characters and want to do them justice, so. Um, I just wanted to give a quick overview. We already kind of talked about this, but um, 
once you have your costume, you're approved. Um, we do all kinds of events. Um, we've gone to the Ronald McDonald House. We've supported animal shelters in our areas. Um, we do like uh, the Pancreatic Cancer Walk, American Heart Association, um, any kind of um, fundraising walk. Uh, the sporting event there, I believe, was the Warriors yep. libraries, obviously. Um, and, of course, virtual events, um, especially during the pandemic. Yeah. Um, there's a question about a wedding. So we have been asked, as the Rebel Legion, not to do weddings right now. Um, I do know in the area, at least Golden Gate Garrison, which is the 501st, was test piloting doing some weddings to see how that went. Um, and they haven't really released back to members how they went, if we're gonna do more. So maybe in the future we will be able to do them, but right now we've been asked not to do weddings, unfortunately. <laughs> but so essentially everything that we do is on a volunteer charity basis. Um, so it, it obviously the sporting events are in conjunction with Lucasfilm, um, but there's always some kind of charity donation or component to what we're doing, um, because this is not our intellectual property, it's Lucasfilm's intellectual property. Um, so, you know, I don't wanna get too deep into the weeds here, but there are obviously companies who run um, party businesses for profit, which are getting into that intellectual property. And, you know, we have to be careful to not get too close to that line. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to give you guys a couple of links if you wanted to explore on your own. Um, we have a website where you can request us. You can find out more about us, which is endorbase.org. Um, we have an Instagram at endorbase. We also have a Facebook. Um, and if you were someone who uh, is 18 plus and you're trying to build a costume and you're hoping for a mentor or some help, um, you can look for Project Hope for Enderbase on Facebook and send us a request. And um, I believe also on our Facebook, there's a, um, I mean, on our website, there's a form you can fill out if you're interested in having a mentor um, assigned to you for a particular costume. Uh, it just sends an email to us, so we'll get back to you. Um, just for the overall organization, here's their links. Um, not that exciting, but there it is. <laughs> <laughs> and um, at this point, uh, I know we've had some questions maybe we didn't get to address in the comments, but um, if you have additional comments, questions, feel free to unmute and ask. You can turn on your video if you want, but you don't have to. We, we'd love to hear from you. And I typed it in the chat, but for everybody who um, is in the audience, if you want to type in what your like dream Star Wars costume would be, go ahead and just share it with us. Uh, we can help you get whichever way you want to go. Um, and it doesn't have to just be good guys, although we are the good guys. We can get you to the bad guys too if you need it. Yeah, so the other clubs... There are other clubs, obviously. So the 501st Legion is for the bad guy costumes. Um, there's also the Mandalorian Mercs, which are for kind of the named Mandalorian characters and also generic Mandalorian characters. Um, there is also Saber Guild, which is a lightsaber choreography group. Um, some of the costumes cross over between the different groups, but that can get complicated. <laughs> Um, like, uh, Bo, oh, when did you start cosplaying? All right, I saw that, so I guess I'll go first. Um, <laughs> 2014 is when I officially started with actually a Legend of Korra costume, because <laughs> uh, I really wanted to go to, like, the last ever panel ever at New York City Comic Con in costume, so I did that. Uh, the first time I did any Star Wars cosplay was uh, early 2016, April, April or March 2016, which is like my very first version of Jakku Ray. 
um, which I like, if you want to talk about coming a long way and everybody starts somewhere, um, the arm wraps were literally double stick tape to my arm. <laughs> <laughs> They're not now. Uh, and that was painful, but like, so that's where I started. Um, I just kept going, uh, I've done a bunch of other things. Uh, if you want to talk about dream costumes, I did finally get my dream costume of Ewok Village Leia. So you can always start somewhere and get your dream costume and it's totally possible. So this is probably blasphemy, but um, I started out as more of a Star Trek fan and I've been around in um, kind of nerd circles for a long time, but um, Star Trek costumes are not something I was particularly interested in wearing. So Star Wars is a much more interesting universe for me as far as costuming. Um, I did not start cosplaying until 2017, 2018. Um, and, you know, you can start anytime. I'm not going to tell you my age, but it's definitely over 40. Um, <laughs> you know, it, the, it's about the costume and uh, replicating what's on screen. It's not about what you yourself looks like. So um, it's just a great organization for that. I'll add on to that uh, since I am the other elder in the group here. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've been, uh, you say how, what got me started and when, um, to show my age, I was doing it before we had the word cosplay. Um, and I also did Star Trek first, probably. I mean, I've been in costumes my whole life and then I was in theater. So there was always something, but I got out of it for quite a while. And then like, um, Shelly, I picked it up because my, actually my daughter got involved in this group and said, hey, can you, can you do this with me? You'd be able, you'd be good as Leia. So that was 2018. And somebody asked a question about how you get into this if you don't have any sewing or crafting skills. There are people who, if you're willing to pay for it, <laughs> there are people that you can um, custom order things from, or if, you know, like I said, I got help with one of my costume pieces because it just involved a lot of embroidering and sewing that I couldn't do. So um, there are ways. Uh, you just need to be careful uh, that even though a costume might look good that you can buy online, uh, it, like it looks good, there are, are gonna be subtle little things that aren't acceptable. Um, for approval. So um, just get in touch with us uh, by one of the methods that we posted and we'll help you navigate. Uh, yeah, so I too am one of those who has been cosplaying for many, many years. I, I started cosplaying in 2003 um, and I was in my teens, so I'll date myself there. Um, I, got into Star Wars costuming uh, around the same time as everybody else again. Uh, so 2017 is when I built uh, my first version of Hera. And that was just like, I watched Star Wars Rebels and I went, I love her, I need to do this now. So I just kind of slammed through it in like a couple of weeks and I was like still sitting there madly sewing at the hotel, con you know, at the convention hotel until like literally I had to get dressed for the photo shoot. <laughs> so that was fun, but I met a lot of really cool people from that. But um, like, I'm fortunate that I was taught how to sew and all of that stuff. And I, like Shelly, I also have an art background. So it just all kind of naturally comes together for me. But um, as far as, if you don't have those skills, um, a lot of people in the group will exchange skills. So for instance, I'm, I, I, can, I know a lot about sewing and so forth. So for instance, you know, uh, my clone armor, I got a lot of help from a couple of the guys who are clones in our group. And in exchange, you know, I helped them out, you know, painting something or sewing something for them, you know, using my skill sets. So that's another good way to go about it if you don't, you know, necessarily have the skills or time or whatever. And I think um, it also depends, like Pat just said, it depends on what you want to do. 
Um, like a Jedi costume is a pretty approachable costume um, for even a, a beginning sewer. Uh, I'm not going to say it's easy because I would never say that about any kind of sewing. But, um, <laughs> but you know, if you don't have an advanced skill set, you probably don't want to start with an incredibly advanced costume because you're going to get frustrated. Um, you know, we all have to start somewhere. None of us like just magically came out knowing how to do everything. Um, but there, you can always get paired with a mentor. Um, there's lots of help to be found. Um, you know, I, and like Lindsay said, like for Cardoon, I don't do stuff with leather. I just am not interested in learning how to do that at this time. I don't need to buy more stuff to live in my garage. Um, and so I was able to trade someone um, to help her paint her armor, which I enjoy doing, for her doing the boots for me. So um, I think there's a pretty great community that we have as far as um, trying to help each other out to, to get these accomplished. And as far as... Um, commissions we didn't really touch on that too much but um you can commission these costumes you don't have to make them yourself they just have to be to meet the standard so uh no seller is going to be able to guarantee you'll be approved because it's about how the costume fits you um but they will say we make this costume to rebel legion standards you'll want to do your due diligence to make sure that that's the case but um there are things you can look for as far as purchasing costumes to make sure that you're on the right track yeah. Um, you know, track records of people that you are purchasing from, if they have been approved before with the same pattern, but, and like ask you a lot of detailed measurements. Um, that's always really great. Um, I do also have a generic Jedi that somebody in this group, uh, made, but she also is very much into like, I can help you. What's your pattern? What's your template? You want to do it. Um, and the other thing that I will say, as I've done this myself is, you know, no mock-ups will get you in trouble <laughs> sometimes. So do mock-ups if you're doing a pattern and everything. If you think something's super complicated, definitely do mock-ups. Um, and then in groups, you can say like, does this flow right? Does this look right before you use potentially your fabric that um, I know like one fabric I have was like $30 a yard or something, not like kind of ridiculous like that, but it's, you know, it's the screen use fabric. So they, they want that. Um, that's a big thing too, is doing mock-ups. If you are new to sewing and you're learning, uh, do that, like get some cheap fabric or even old bed sheets. Yeah. Yeah, and I would say like, I, fa I made the custom fabric for Cara Dune with a Cricut um, and weeding heat transfer vinyl for probably 60 plus hours. So cutting into that fabric was absolutely terrifying. And I made at least eight, um, mock-ups before I got to that point because I did not want to mess that up. Um, yeah. So <laughs> someone has a question about armor templates. Do you mean as far as what type of costume are, are you referring to? I guess yeah. would help us answer that question. Yeah. And then while we're getting that information, I'm going to add um, Jedi are also the most like cost effective ways to join the Rebel Legion. Um, there are lots of places you can go to get fabric for less than average. Um, buying old, like not bed sheets, but if you go to local fabrics, not local fabric stores, but like Goodwill stores, they have a section for fabric in the back. And it's usually like $3 for this giant tablecloth that nobody wants anymore. Um, and is just like the perfect texture uh, or curtains. I'm a big fan of making Jedi out of whatever leftover fabric you can find. I think that's one of the reasons I end up with too many colors. <laughs> well, Jedi like, oh, are what also going to do with this. Yeah. Jedi are also one of our more customizable costumes. Like, there's just certain things that you have to meet as far as the standard, but um, it's not like a specific character where you have to do exactly everything the way that that character did it. So you can kind of develop your own your own character and give it a little more personality. So, and also like, you know, boots and belt and the lightsaber are gonna be the more expensive parts, but you can get boots, you know, for cheap at Target, you can get boots at Goodwill. You don't have to like go completely crazy. <laughs> yeah, for like 
price comparison, I have two Jedi belts, a black one and a brown one. The brown one was expensive. It's like pure leather that I bought uh, from a retailer for like 125 bucks at the time. The black one is from Goodwill and it costs $17 in total to make. And then you can go in between and my Jedi belt, which is black, is from Galaxy's Edge <laughs> and approvable. And I got a discount as an annual pass holder at the time. So <laughs> like $60 with a discount. So you can go the full range. Um, and and I'm gonna say mine I got on Amazon and I think cost me $30. <laughs> Yeah, I also, uh, Pat helped me during the early days of COVID. I wanted to, I got into a project of making masks and wanting to use up all the material I had. I had a lovely blue linen curtain. I had some gray bed sheets and whatever. And she made a beautiful <laughs> Jedi costume for me out of all that stuff that I had. And uh, yeah, so it was fun. So as right. far as the armor templates, I see some some clarification here. So, uh, I mean, I'm not an expert on either of those costumes, but um, so for the Mandalorian mercs, if you're talking about just generic Mandalorians as opposed to the Mandalorian, uh, I believe most of them use either 3D printed armor or they use um, Sintra, um, which is a material you can buy by the sheet and cut and shape. Um, and I would go to their website to find out more information on how, how they do that. Um, so uh, as far as stormtroopers, I believe that's usually a kit that's ABS plastic. Um, yes. I don't think the 501st accepts um, very much variation from that. Um, I know you can use EVA foam to make armor, but uh, unless it doesn't look like foam, you might have trouble getting it approved through the various clubs. So I'm not saying don't use it. I'm just saying uh, do research if you're planning to apply um, because it might not get accepted. Uh, like, and Cara Dune's armor in the, the show, I believe actually is like leather covered foam, but they don't, Rebel Legion doesn't accept it because it's not very durable. So if you're gonna wear it for a bunch of events as opposed to filming for a while, uh, we kind of have different standards. Yeah, durable is the key word here. <laughs> So yeah, like the stormtrooper armor, and I'm sure Pat can say something on it too. Similarly to the clone armor, it comes to you in kits. It can be very expensive depending on the type you get. And like a lot of the, you, you sort of run into a problem where a lot of the kits that are currently available are made for a very specific body type. And if you don't fit that body type, you are going to have a lot of trouble. You'll have to do a lot of adjustments and be really careful about how you address those adjustments. Yep. And I would, say, I would say we do have build parties when we're not in a pandemic where people get together and someone who has made that costume can actually help you do it. <laughs> yeah, and like what Lindsay was saying about the armor, um, it is tricky um, and like she said, it gets very expensive and getting it to fit you just right is tricky. Um, there are definitely kits out there. Um, the other thing is the 501st has super extensive tutorials on how to put those together. If I had paid more attention to the tutorial, it would have told me that the kit that I had mislabeled the shin pieces. So I actually wouldn't have wasted my time putting the wrong pieces together the first time and wondering why they didn't fit. And then having to go back and be like, what happened? Oh, company error. So a lot of, it is, there's like a lot of pre-research you'll want to do ahead of time. And yeah, I actually have a printout here. Uh, you probably can't see with the background, but it's a printout of the costume reference for the my particular clone. So it's got all of the, um, it has all of the painting details, it has where things are supposed to be, how things are supposed to look, you know, this should be, you know, depending on your height, this should be, you know, between two and three inches and so on and so forth. So they get very, very specific and they break it down for you a lot. Yeah, and they're, um, 
they're very detailed, very good. Uh, the local one also has a lot of people that are very willing to help. Um, and if you are wondering if your body type isn't going to fit into armor, um, Pat has done a bunch as well as uh, we have another member that is a little more south who has made it so she can actually sit in her stormtrooper armor, which is impressive because you can't usually do that. Uh, yeah, that's <laughs> like, what? Who is that? <laughs> Diana. Oh, uh, okay, yeah, that's right. Uh, and she's also done a full clone. Um, we have, you know, people that are even taller, so they have to, then the actual, you know, who the armor is made for, so they have to extend upwards, extend outwards. Uh, I also do Kylo Ren, so I have to, like, figure out how to be not uh, looking very female identifying so that way like I've had parts of the costume to make it look more like a guy um so you can do all these different things um and again there's no also gender requirements for any costume you can be whoever you want to be as long as you meet the standards yeah let's see uh Sarah who is our Chewbacca she's five foot four yeah so <laughs> there's a you know, the stilts, stilts are a thing. That's awesome. Chance, I noticed you have a check mark. Did you have a question? Just to make sure before we start to close things out. And once, going twice. Okay. Well, I really wanted to thank you guys for being here today. It's been absolutely amazing. Um, really appreciate very informative and i never realized how much it coincides with what the library does with 3d printing and we have sewing machines too and sometimes have makers things it was just absolutely an awesome job really appreciate you guys and hopefully we will get to see everyone in person on april 30th at the sonoma marin fairgrounds when we have lumicon live so thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. We wouldn't miss it. <laughs> thank you for having us. Thank you. Have a thank you. Day. Thanks.